welcome to Seeking Truth in Torah with myself, Yosef Ben Avram. And I'm glad to bring you part four of the Covenant series. And we've been speaking about the final remnant, a people of covenant. Now, if you haven't had the opportunity to listen to part one to three, then I really urge you to try and stop this teaching. Go back and listen to part one, part two, and part three. In part one, we spoke about the Abrahamic covenant as it relates to our salvation. In part two, we spoke about the Mosaic covenant as it relates to how we are to mature and how it is our guide and how it helps us to remain in that pure state, how to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. In part three, we spoke about the inheritance covenant, how Yahweh wants you and I to go from milk to meat, how he wants us to grow up from being children into sons and daughters, sons and daughters that are ready to inherit the kingdom of God. Now in part four, we're going to be touching on the bridal covenant and we're going to be speaking about the ancient Hebrew wedding and how that relates to the words of Messiah Yeshua and how we can see through the ancient wedding how we are to prepare, how we are to grow and how we are to be that pure spotless bride. So before we start, I'd just like us to pray. Abba Father, I want to come to you in the name of Yeshua Mashiach. And Father, I want to pray today, Father, that you will give me the strength, Father, to do this teaching. Father, I want to pray that I will allow your spirit, Father, to move and allow your spirit to speak through my life. Father, I want to be a vessel that is used for your glory and your glory alone. And Father, I want to pray a blessing over each and every person that is tuned in to this teaching. Father, I pray that these covenant teachings father will become part of their life father that it will not just be a teaching that goes in the ear but father that it will become a lifestyle that they live and father that you will look upon them and give them strength in the name of yeshua father i want to pray for those that are not feeling themselves father those that are maybe feeling downcast today yahweh like there is no purpose for them in this life father i reject those lies and we we pray over them today father that they too will reject those lies And Father, that you will strengthen them in the mighty name of Yeshua. And Father, that you will bless them and keep them and make your face to shine upon them. Father, we thank you today that we can do this teaching. And I just pray, Father, for your guidance. I pray, Father, for your anointing. And I pray, Yahweh, as your word says, where the anointing of God is, it breaks the yokes of the enemy. So I pray for that in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now, if you have your Bible with you, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 6. And we read there the following. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. Brothers and sisters, the fourth and final covenant is one that has both been misunderstood as well as abused by many theologians over the centuries. And you know, today many believe that once they are saved, they automatically become the bride. But the truth is, when we take a complete view of scripture, that's when we get a completely different understanding. You see, we can see from this passage alone that it is the duty of the bride to make herself ready. And this is in contrast to what many believe today. You know, teachers and preachers proclaim that all you need is salvation and that it's a free gift of Yahweh, which is truth. I believe that too. I believe that it is a free gift of God. But they continue to say that you don't need to do anything else because you're eternally saved. And you know, brethren, if that is the view that you hold, then I'm afraid that you are in for a very big surprise in these final days. You see, it's the duty of the bride to make herself ready. It's the duty of the bride to work out her salvation with fear and trembling, to live a holy and pure life and to enter the covenants of Yahweh so that she might have the right garments when he comes to fetch her. Brothers and sisters, if you haven't had the time to listen to the truth about one saved, always saved, that teaching on our channel, then I urge you to also listen to it so that you can understand what Yahweh is truly saying and when eternal life is actually granted. Now in Revelation chapter 22 verse 14, it speaks about those who will have the right to eat the tree of life. And I would like to show you the same verse in two different translations to prove to you that it is our duty to make sure that we have clean garments and that the keeping of Torah is essentially the missing ingredient in many believers' lives. The second covenant is the missing ingredient in many believers' lives. 
And it is one of the reasons why many will not have correct clothing on. Now, Revelation chapter 22, verse 14 reads the following. It reads like this in the NIV. It says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Now, brothers and sisters, the washing of the robes is done by the believer. But the question then is, how do we wash our robes that we cannot see? How do you wash robes that cannot be seen? And the answer becomes clear when we take a look at a better translation. Now in Revelation chapter 22 verse 14 in the King James Bible, the Scriptures Bible, and in a few different translations, the translators have left it in its original context. And it says the following, and you can go and check this up. Go and check it up. I didn't put it on the screen for a reason. I want you to go and check like a good Berean. Go and check it up. Go and read it in the, in, in the King James Bible. Go and read it in the Scriptures Bible. And you will see the following. It says, Revelation. 22 14 blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city now that changes a lot compared to what it said in the niv the niv reads blessed are those who wash their robes but in the the king james bible it is telling us how we keep our garments clean by doing the commandments of god by keeping the shabbat by doing the festivals by by feeding the 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 Orphan and looking after the widow and showing kindness to your fellow man and kindness to everyone else included. You see, the King James Bible explains to us how we can keep our garments clean once we are saved. Once you and I have entered the first covenant of salvation, it's our duty, brothers and sisters, to keep our garments clean. And we do this by walking out the Torah, by walking in the second covenant of God and doing the acts of of God's word. You know, when I was in seminary, there was a man that came and said to us something, and, and I, I'm sure he got it somewhere else, but it will always stick with me. He said, you know, the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, what does it mean? He said to us, and I remember him saying, brothers and sisters, you must remember, you must remember that this book that has been given to you is essential to your faith and your walk in Messiah. And then he said to us, remember, basic instructions before leaving earth. It is our manual, brothers and sisters, from Genesis to Revelation on how to live a righteous life, how to know our God. It's all about the acts of Torah. It's all about looking after the widow and the orphan. It's about keeping Shabbat. It's about Yahweh's festivals. And, and, and the question I'd like to ask you is, does this sound like the majority of believers today? No, it doesn't. Why? Because the majority of believers are remaining in the first covenant they refuse to move into the second and then we have those that are in the second covenant that are refusing to grow and become the sons and daughters we have a cycle brothers and sisters and you know what the problem is we like to set up camp we like to remain in a place where it's comfortable because it suits us but Yahweh says you know what you need to move and I've said this over and over and over and so often we wonder why did brothers and sisters move? Why did people go? Why did things happen and I'm still here? It's because Yahweh moved and those people heard his voice. Those people heard his voice. Brothers and sisters, you see, Yahweh wants you and I to mature because when we understand the concept of marriage in relation to our relationship with Yeshua, that's when we begin to see that it's all about intimacy. You see, Yahweh's plan in the Garden of Eden was to have an intimate relationship with Adam and Eve. And we know that that became corrupted. Why? Because of man's sin. But Abba Father wants to renew that relationship. And he has set forth his plan of redemption and intimacy through his covenants as well as through his festivals. Brothers and sisters, never in the scriptures does it say these are the festivals of the Jews. It always says these are Yahweh's appointed times moedim it's his appointments with mankind but unfortunately half of the mankind doesn't want to listen or go to the appointed times they don't want to do it because they have a heart that is divided you see what we need to understand is that not everyone who accepts salvation not everyone who accepts salvation will desire or aspire to become the bride Many will just consider the sacrifice too high and instead remain just a believer or as we stated before, a child and never truly want to become a son or a daughter who is ready to inherit the kingdom. Now I've stated so many times on all of these teachings and I'm going to say it again. 
So many people don't understand what salvation is all about. Salvation, they have put such a big thing on salvation. But what we need to understand is salvation equals salvation. Nothing more, nothing less. The truth is, yes, you will be at the wedding. Because the Bible says that there are many who attend the wedding. But not all are going to be under the chuppah. And you know, the Gospels are clear that there are different groups of people who will attend the final wedding. And in the end, the choice will be yours as to where you will be standing. Will you be one who is looking on as a guest? Or will you be one who is standing with a groom under the chuppah of his protection? Go and read that in Matthew chapter 21 to 6, Matthew 22, 1 to 14, and Matthew 25, 1 to 13. It details the wedding and it tells us that there will be guests at that wedding. Brothers and sisters, think about that for a second. In the ancient Hebrew wedding, when my, my, my wife and I got married, we stood under a chuppah. And I'll never forget it because we were under the chuppah where the minister, the rabbi was standing and he was speaking to us. But the guests were just looking on. They were not able to stand with us under the chuppah. They were there, but they did not enjoy the, the intimacy of what was actually taking place under the chuppah. You see, what many believers do not understand is that you cannot be married without being completely in covenant. And this is of utmost importance. Only once you have entered all three preceding covenants and are living them out in your life, then, only then, are you ready to enter in to the final one. This, I believe, is the very reason why the understanding of covenants in relation to the final remnant is a subject of such great importance in this final hour. You see, we are alive, I believe, in the generation that will see the true revealing of the sons and daughters of God, and they will form part of Yahweh's army. And we are living in a generation where the preparation of this end time bride is taking place. You see, Yahweh wants to use those as forerunners to prepare his army, so that in the end, that's why the Bible says, those who have insight will lead many to the truth, Daniel, but those who don't, will remain wicked. The truth is that many, brothers and sisters, many have no idea of the process. They have no idea of the process and the cost that Yeshua says we need to pay and endure so that we might be pure and spotless and ready to marry Him. But what they also forget is that the Bible says that I have given you all things for life and godliness. If you give him your heart 100%, he says in his word that he has given you all things for life and godliness, that the power that raised Yeshua from the dead is the same power that now lives in you. So we cannot turn around and say, oh, but we can't make it. We can if we just believe. Brothers and sisters, if you want to understand the book of Revelation, if you want to understand that book of Revelation and the plan of Yahweh, then you need to understand the process of an ancient wedding ceremony. Now, contrary to what many might think, an ancient Hebrew wedding was not arranged. It was not an arranged marriage as in many Eastern countries. What many people do not know is that the bride and the groom had more choice than many of us would like to think. And this is important because if we state that their marriage is, is, is completely arranged, then when we take a look at the marriage of Yeshua to his bride, we would have no free will or no choice. As we know that this isn't true. We know that it's not true. Because why? Because you can bail out of this thing called salvation right up until the day that Messiah Yeshua returns. You can choose not to walk it out anymore. And the same applied to the ancient wedding of a bride and a groom. She could bail out at any time. She could decide to say no right up until the day that they were standing under the chuppah and she was to say, I do. Before that, right up until that point, she could decide this isn't for me. I don't want it anymore. I don't want it anymore. And the same applies to you. You can choose by your wicked lifestyle, brothers and sisters, to, to, to leave this thing called salvation. Now both the bride and the groom had a choice, even though the parental approval was essential. Both the bride and groom could decide that they didn't want this marriage and they could pull out at any time in the negotiations. A bride had a choice to say no right up until the moment she said, I do. And if she's decided that this was not for her, she could just say, no, I don't want to go on with it anymore. You know, unlike today, 
where people meet and date for a couple of months, then decide to get married. The ancient Hebrew wedding was more a process that involved each of the party's families. And many times the process took years, brothers and sisters. Sometimes it took years. And what is important is that both fathers would enter into covenant with each other. And the fathers would promise to look after the couple that was about to be married. Unlike today where people get married and then they try their best to get as far away from their families as possible. To begin their new life together. It's kind of like, you know, I just want to run away from my mom and dad. I've had enough of them now. No, that's not how it was in the ancient world. The families would form a lasting bond. And they would understand the importance of covenant and the importance of family. You see, the process was one of detail. And everything that happened during negotiations had a meaning. And it's these meanings that have lost their understanding in the modern church due to them serving their, or severing, not serving, severing their ties with their Hebraic heritage. Here today, many are returning, brothers and sisters, praise Yeshua. Many are returning today to the ancient ways. And they are taking a deeper look at the words and teachings of Yeshua through the Hebraic lens. You see, only once we understand the ancient Hebrew wedding rituals, only then can we truly put the words of Yeshua into perspective that is spoken in the book of Revelation. You see, on that day, the groom made the first initial move. And on that day, he would bring his father with him to the intended bride's home. And what needs to be noted is that they would bring with them the following, a betrothal cup, a bottle of wine, and the bride price, which in Hebrew is called a mohar. And it was here that they would then knock on the door. And what would happen is the bride's father would then come to the door and oftentimes look out a side window to see who was there. He would then identify the visitors and tell his daughter the following. He would tell his daughter, hey, your, your groom is here with his father. She would then confirm to her father whether or not she wanted to get married. Oftentimes, this was already settled in her heart, and it would be a nod of her head, and the father would then open the door. Now, the bride's father would then come to the door and oftentimes look out the window, like I said. And what would happen is he would look out and see who it was, and then he would tell his daughter, and the daughter would then confirm it. And the door would open, and this is where it gets interesting. Because once the door was open, it was only the beginning of the negotiations. And this would mark the beginning of the betrothal process. And it was there that the terms and conditions of the marriage would be worked out. They would begin to discuss the terms and conditions. And, and this is what, where we begin to see the process. And when we begin to understand the process of the terms and conditions, that's when we begin to see how covenant actually fits together. We also begin to understand the words of Yeshua in Revelation 3.20 by this picture that was painted for us, where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him. He will also sup with me. You see, this is the invitation of the groom to the would-be bride. And what Yeshua is doing is he's making the request to each and every one of us at the point of salvation, which is the first covenant. But it's here that you and I, it's here that you and I need to open the door. And it's here that many of us never truly sit to listen to the terms of the betrothal covenant, the Mosaic covenant. You see, brothers and sisters, the door would open and the father and the groom would enter in. And immediately the door would shut. And immediately at that point, they would drink the first cup. And that's, that's what it's about. And then they would talk out, the, talk out the terms and conditions of the marriage contract. And this is important. You see, brethren, what we need to understand is that there is so much more to this life than just being saved. What about separation? What about holiness? What about intimacy? And what about walking in the path that Yeshua has destined for us? So, brothers and sisters, once the terms and conditions of the marriage were finalized and the bride price agreed on, that's when the groom would leave with his father to go and prepare a honeymoon suite for his bride. And this was a room that he would build on his father's house. And oftentimes, this would take up to two or more years to complete. Yet it was during this time that the bride was to make herself ready. She was to learn from her mother what it meant to actually be a wife. And it was throughout this time that she had to remain pure and dedicated to the man she had hardly even seen, yet she loved so deeply. Yet while the groom was building the house for his bride, 
It's here that he would send her gifts, things such as clothing and other things of beauty. Now, when I looked at this, it's almost, it just kind of gets illuminated in your mind. And isn't this just an amazing picture of what Yeshua has done for us? Nearly 2,000 years have passed. And the scriptures say that one day is like a thousand years. You know, it was Yeshua that said that he goes to prepare a place for us. And he told us that he will not leave us orphans, but that he would send the promised Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and that he would be guided, that we would be guided into all truth. You see, Ephesians tells us that Yeshua went down to Hades, but also rose again. And when he rose, he gave gifts to men, spiritual gifts, gifts that would empower us to live a holy life as we wait for our groom, as we wait for that one or two years until he returns. Two thousand years. You know, yet today, many don't even know what their gifts are. They seem to struggle to identify with being sons and daughters. You know, today many would rather call themselves servants of Yahweh, which is what we all should be. But we are not to remain there as we grow up into Messiah and reflect Him as we mature into His sons and daughters. Now, brothers and sisters, as we've come to see from taking a deeper look at all the various covenants, opening the door is actually the same as accepting Yeshua into your heart. You see, it's at that point that we are accepting the sacrifice and desiring to know him in a more intimate way. It's here that we enter into the Abrahamic covenant or the blood covenant. It's also at this point that we are included into the family and we can choose whether or not we are going to mature or stay in the outer court. Remember, the outer court is the place of judgment in the end of days. You see, it's the place of sacrifice and it's the place of the brazen labor. You see, many believers have done just that. Right now, as I'm speaking in this teaching, many believers are happy to remain at this point. And they have absolutely no desire to see what is further in the tabernacle for them. Brothers and sisters, as I have stated many times in all the teachings, to become the bride of Yeshua requires commitment. It requires denying of our flesh so that we can live in His Spirit. It requires desiring to be intimate with Him through a devoted prayer life. And it requires a man or a woman who is willing to go far beyond the status of just being a believer and actually choosing to be a true disciple. You know, it's at this point that we need to show the Elijah-Elisha effect. Now, I have been teaching on the final remnant. And what I believe is I believe that the 144,000, those who conform to the image of Messiah Yeshua, those who truly get it, those that go from the outer court into the Holy of Holies, those that have passed through the Abrahamic covenant, through the Mosaic covenant, into the sons and daughters, the sons and daughters of inheritance. I believe, brothers and sisters, that they will make up the Elijah remnant of God in this final generation. And by their proclamation and by their teaching, there will be others that will listen and they will hear. But unfortunately, it will take them a process to get pure, to get right. And those who choose not to walk in that way, they will be left one side. But you know, praise be to Yahweh that in every generation, God has had a remnant. And I believe that just like the Elijah was taken up to be with God, so too we will see the 144,000 die for their faith and they will be lifted up unto Yahweh and there will be another remnant which I believe will be in the spirit of Elisha. And we see that pattern with Elisha when he walks out and the, the children are mocking him and saying, hey, you baldy, hey, you baldy, as I said in a previous teaching. And then they, they're mocking him and what happens? The bears come out and tear the children and the number of the children is 42. 42 is the same number of the time period given over to the anti-Messiah. It is also the time period that the Gentiles and the, and the, and the temple of God is left outside and that, that the section of the outer court is trampled under feet by the Gentiles. So brothers and sisters, you can choose today. It doesn't take away your salvation. You're still saved. But unfortunately, you need to mature a little. And that's why Yahweh says his fire is being sent to us to purify us. You see, brothers and sisters, you can choose to be part of the Elijah or you can choose to remain. And when you remain, brothers and sisters, you will have to go through the times that Yahweh is destined because he wants to have a pure and spotless bride. 
Brothers and sisters, in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says the following, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Ephesians 1.10 says the following, That in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Messiah, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Messiah, in whom he also trusted after he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that he believed he was sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The spirit of promise, brothers and sisters, is what sealed you and I. And it is the promise of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of His glory. Now the question is, how many of us are willing to separate ourselves from the things that defile us and are not pleasing to Yahweh? In Elijah's day, there was only 7,000 that chose not to bow down to Baal. Brothers and sisters, let's get back to the bride. Just as the bride was able to back out of the process at any time, so too you and I. Do not be fooled, brothers and sisters, in thinking that once you accept Yeshua into your life, that is all you need to do. Salvation is by faith. Yet as we saw in Revelation chapter 22 verse 14, only those who have washed their robes will have the right to the tree of life. Remember I said in a previous teaching, and please don't take my words and twist them. I am not saying, brothers and sisters, that you need to do anything else for salvation. But if salvation is all that you want, then stay and do nothing more. But if you want to be in the image of your king, if you want to be a son and no longer a child, then it takes some growing up. You see, salvation is by faith alone. But after faith, brothers and sisters, comes obedience. And after obedience comes living a life that is focused on glorifying your God. Now, what I wanted to say to you is that in Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, it says, Only those who have washed their robes, they are the ones who have the right to the tree of life. Now, in a previous teaching, I also mentioned that we need to see this in 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 a picture form. So let me try and help you. Imagine you and I are driving in a car. We are traveling on the freeway and there is an accident. Both of us are in that accident. And the paramedics come and they collect us and they put us into the ambulance. Now what I want you to understand is that we are saved, but we are not yet eternally alive. In other words, we are saved from that situation and we are placed in the ambulance and we are heading on our way to the new Jerusalem. But at any time, brothers and sisters, that ambulance can have another accident. It can have an accident on its way to the new Jerusalem. And that's what Paul says. He says, I work out my my faith with fear and trembling so that I may obtain the prize. Paul himself in another passage of scripture says that he preaches the word of God and he preaches every day. And he knows that if he if he doesn't remain in Messiah Yeshua, he too might fall away. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand this. We need to understand that it is our duty to, to walk in Yahweh's truth so that we might have the right garments. That's very, very important. Now getting back to where we were. Eternal life, brethren, like I said, have a look at the scriptures. Eternal life comes at the end. You are not eternally alive now. You are saved and you have a hope that if you continue, one day you will be redeemed and you will be with Messiah Yeshua. What we need to remember is that salvation is a free gift, like I said, but you can still give it back at any time through your wicked lifestyle. Now over my years of study I've come to learn a lot about the ancient wedding ceremony and how the process was undertaken. Once I was able to understand this, the words of Yeshua in Revelation took on a true meaning and a real significance. Throughout the negotiation process the families would engage in various rituals that would form the lasting bond between the two families. Now if you remember Revelation chapter 3.20 and the reference to sup with him, this is exactly what the groom and the father would be doing while they worked out the details of the wedding together. You see they would sit and discuss the terms and then at that point they would drink the first of four cups of wine. Now each of these cups of wine were very symbolic in their purpose and we also need to remember that there are four cups of wine that are consumed 
during a traditional Passover Seder. Now, the first cup was called the cup of sanctification. You see, we are justified through our faith. But as we accept that sacrifice, we enter into a process of sanctification, a process that is meant to continue until Yeshua returns, until we are all glorified. This is why Paul says that we are in the process of being changed from faith to faith and from glory to glory. And what is also interesting is that the first cup was almost consumed immediately after the door was closed. Everyone that was of age would drink of the first cup as a symbol that each family was willing to serve the other family. The second cup was called the cup of betrothal, or commonly the cup of plagues. And it represents the second covenant that a believer is meant to enter into, namely the walking out of God's Torah. And this cup was only consumed by the groom and the respective fathers. It was here that the two terms and conditions of the marriage were discussed, such as the bride price, the possessions, etc., and what the groom was willing to give to the bride, and what the bride was to be, or what the bride was expected to do in return. Now, the question I'd like to ask you is: Doesn't that sound familiar? It was in the book of Exodus that we read that Yahweh spoke forth His Torah. And he wanted to put his law in their hearts. But what happened? The people got scared and said, No, you go, Moshe, and we will do all that God commands. You see, brothers and sisters, fear gets us to stop doing what Yahweh wants. Now, unfortunately, this is the point where many err and turn away. They seem to run away when they hear that there is something more that they need to do. They simply cannot see that the covenants are all about a deepening relationship with Yeshua. The one saved, always saved camp raises a flag and they seem to puff out their chest at those who desire to walk in this intimacy. And the reason for this is the false understanding of the difference between salvation and works. You see, the Bible is very clear that no man is justified by his works. Yet James makes it clear that if you have faith, then there needs to be some kind of works. He says, show me your faith and I will show you my works. Today, many will say that the works are things like evangelism or social justice or things like that. But the truth of the matter is that your obedience is a product. It's an outworking of your faith. It's the doers of the word, the doers of the Torah. There was no New Testament When James wrote that, not just the hearers that are blessed, it's the doers of the word, not just the hearers. Furthermore, the Bible says that you shall know them by their fruits. Never ever are we justified by the keeping of Torah, no, but we begin to see those who have fruits by the works that they do according to the Torah. Now getting on and carrying on, we get to the third cup. And the third cup is known as the cup of redemption. It was this cup that officially sealed the marriage agreement between the bride and groom. And it was this cup that was only consumed by the bride and the groom. And this is what the inheritance is all about. You see, only those who choose to mature will ever truly have that deep, intimate relationship with Yeshua that is shared only by the bride and the groom. A relationship that is so close to marriage that it almost is impossible to tell the difference. You see, it was at this point that the bride and groom were practically married. Although the ceremony had not taken place and the consummation hadn't happened yet, it's the third cup that is extremely significant to our understanding. Why? Because it was this cup that Yeshua shared with his disciples in the book of Luke chapter 22, 20, as well as Matthew 26, 27 to 28. You see, it was at this point that Yeshua acts as a servant to his disciples, and he washed their feet. He is transferring his inheritance to them. He is showing them that, hey, you know what? I am going to leave you soon, but I don't leave you orphans. And he told them, remember, he said that there was a time coming, and they needed to understand that they were going to be prepared for what lies ahead. And Yeshua said that he would not drink of the cup of wine until the end. Matthew 26 verse 29 says, I tell you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you. Where? In my Father's kingdom. You see, what's interesting is that this was the custom of an ancient Hebrew wedding. The groom would not drink wine again until the actual wedding ceremony. And this brings us, brothers and sisters, to the fourth and final cup, the cup of praise. You see, this fourth and final cup will be drunk by the true bride of Yeshua 
on the wedding day of the Lamb. And you know, what needs to be noted here is that the time of the groom's arrival was a surprise, and therefore the bride and her bridal party had to always be ready. And this is what the parable of the ten virgins is all about. You see, five had oil, they had the spirit, and five did not. It was always customary as well for one of the groom's party to go ahead of the bridegroom, and he would lead the way to the bride's house. You know, it's here that we need to dig deeper and get a fuller understanding of the role of the Elijah, or if you want to call it, the 144, or the remnant. You see, the duty of those who form part of this group is to be walking and moving in the spirit of Elijah, the very same spirit that was found in John the Immerser, who was called by Yahweh to be a man who prepared the way for Yeshua. You see, John was a type of groomsman, and so too are the 144,000. They are the ones who will prepare the way for the coming king in the spirit and power of Elijah, and they will be walking in all of the covenants of God. Brothers and sisters, the groomsman would walk in front and he would blow the shofar. They would then set up and hold the chuppah and the final blessing over the cup of wine would be pronounced and the promises that were declared in the ketubah would be read out one to each other. And you know, this joyous occasion would culminate in the wedding supper. And you know, unlike today's weddings that last only a few hours, the Hebrew wedding would last for seven days. You see, brethren, marriage, marriage is the culmination of walking in all the covenants. It's the culmination of walking in all the covenants and living a life for the master. If we want to be included in the final chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, then we need to understand how important covenant is to our walk in Messiah. We need to ask ourselves, where are we in relation to covenant as it relates to time? Have we stagnated in the first covenant and not allowed the Ruach to purge us? Has our salvation become only that, salvation and nothing else? Have we set up camp in the Torah group we are currently in? Is there a process in our lives of maturing? Is there a process still taking place of maturity in our lives? We need to understand that the time of the third covenant, the time for the sons and daughters of inheritance is at hand. The revealing of the sons and daughters of Yeshua is here, yet many are so fast asleep, trying to figure out how to say the name of Yeshua or how to still keep Shabbat. Brothers and sisters, we need to align ourselves with His instructions and allow His Ruach to cleanse us and to do our best to walk in the covenants so that we can be a light to the nation. Brothers and sisters, the groom is wanting to return. He is wanting to marry his bride and he's waiting for us. And he's preparing his groomsmen. He's preparing his final remnant to prepare the way for him. Brothers and sisters, the choice is yours where you will be standing. Where will you be standing in that tabernacle? Will you do the good or the pleasing? Or will you do the good, pleasing and perfect will of Yahweh? Will you remain in the good? Will you remain in the pleasing? And will you never choose to discover the power of living in the upper room, the place of His glory and the place of His presence, the place of legitimately knowing your God, the place of a son and a daughter of inheritance. Brothers and sisters, I pray and hope that this teaching has spoken to your heart. I pray that this covenant series has really spoken to your heart. I pray that you will go and listen to it over, that you will be able to take notes from it, and that as you walk out these covenants in the understanding that Messiah Yeshua has given to you, that you will grow up to be a true child of inheritance, a son and daughter who is ready to defend the kingdom of their father. Let's pray. Father Yahweh, we want to thank you and praise you. Father Yahweh, I want to give you all the glory and all the honor. And Father, I want to pray in the name of Yeshua Mashiach that every person that has listened to this teaching, Father, that the fire of your Ruach will ignite them in this generation. Father, that as they lay their lives down for you, Father, I pray that you will raise them up in the name of Yeshua. Father, I pray that they will walk in the covenants that you have destined for them. Father, that they will learn, Father, that this needs to become part of them. And as they surrender to you, Father, I pray that they will be raised up. Father, that you will clean them out. 
and father that your spirit will ignite in them the fire and the passion father to continue father i pray that any struggles that they face father that they will overcome them in the name of messiah yeshua father your word says that we are more than conquerors through messiah yeshua father that your word also says that there is now no condemnation for those who walk in the spirit of god who walk according to your spirit and not according to their flesh father i pray that the flesh in them will be crucified and that the spirit of god will rise up in them and that they will be counted worthy in this generation father i thank you for this teaching series i pray a blessing over each and every person father from this day onwards that will come and listen to these teachings may they grow may they be blessed and may they be ready father for your soon return we praise you and we honor you in messiah yeshua's name we pray amen I'd like to invite you, brothers and sisters, to please subscribe to this channel. Subscribing helps us to get these teachings out to more. And we also would like to invite you, please share these teachings. Share them however you feel. Share them on Facebook. Share them on your social media platforms, wherever you feel. And help us to share the Word of God with as many people as possible. I'd also like to invite you to join us on our website at www.seekingtruthintorahministry.com. Become a member, download all our teachings, get them in PDF format, or email us the ones that you require, and we will be happy to email you back and share with you. We also would like to invite you to join us on a Sunday evening at 8 p.m. South African Standard Time for our live broadcast with my wife and myself, where we share from our hearts that which Yahweh is saying to us for that specific week. Again, I thank you for joining me, and I pray that Yahweh will bless you and that you will be a son and a daughter of covenant, a son and daughter that raises up the kingdom of Yahweh in this generation.